All right, welcome to the uh, November 1st, 2023 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Happy November to everyone. Where I was, it was a snowy start, unlike last week where I was sweating this today, I was freezing, that is New England for us. Um, we have lots of folks uh, out there Zooming uh, this evening. Tonight is our public comment session. So we will be hearing from all of you about your feelings regarding one or more of the 10 projects that we have before us this funding round. Um, so thank you again, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll go through what that protocol is for making those comments in in just a moment. We have a few bis a few relatively quick business items to attend to uh, before we begin hearing from you about the projects. So just bear with us for a moment. The first is, as always, we begin our uh, meetings with any general public comment. This is the time for anyone to comment on not a specific project before us this evening, one of the 10 projects that I'm assuming most of you are here uh, to talk about, but any other CPC Community Preservation Committee business that you have uh, that is sort of unrelated to these 10 projects. Um, Barbara uh, Blumenthal, I see your hand up. You may just be trying to queue quickly in line for commenting on projects. Um, but does anyone have any uh, um, uh, uh, comment on general CPC stuff? Sarah, are you seeing any hands up there? Uh, I do not. You're not. Okay, good. Not good, but thank you. Um, moving right along, we have minutes to approve from September 20th. Sarah sent them out a little bit late, so I don't know if everyone had a chance to look at it. It was a brief meeting, uh, but I think uh, if it's okay, we can go ahead and get a motion to approve those minutes. Is there we'll such a motion, them. or did people have, uh, I see Kevin's hand is up. Uh, is there a second, Julia, second? Second. Any comments regarding those minutes of September the 20th? Okay, so there's been a motion, a second to approve. Sarah, you want to take us through the roll call on that? Sure. Uh, Jeff? Yes. Bev? Yes. Martha? Yes. Uh, Chris Tate? Yes. Chris Hellman? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Julia? Yes. And Brian? Uh, two. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I just thought to myself, um, so uh, yeah. you know, thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, a reminder to folks, if you can mute yourselves, uh, unless it is your turn to speak, that's that's helpful for all of us in terms of of, of our ability to, to, to listen to this uh, during this meeting. I have just a few quick things in the chair's report. Um, the first is I had the privilege along with Jeff Jones to attend the dedication of the Habitat for Humanity properties, at least three of the houses up on Burt's Pit Road on this last Saturday. Um, this is not the one near the community gardens, this is the one further up on Burt's Pit. There are actually two projects going on. Jeff, do you have any comments that you wanna share with folks about that? Uh, just that it was, it was a very positive experience overall and that um, all three, uh, families for those three houses were present. And um, in addition to the affordable housing, there was the whole preservation of that whole wooded area um, that already has the bike path uh, put in that people can walk through and it's quite the nature trail. So it's just a very positive experience. Yeah, it's a it's a, a two, two for one conservation land and affordable housing. I think it's rare for us to hear stories from uh, folks that we are helping find housing with our mandate to provide a, affordable housing. And was and as Jeff said, just second that, it was just a very moving experience to hear how, um, hear stories and to hear 
from folks who are moving into those houses. And Habitat does such a good job. So thank you, Habitat. Um, I went from that to the uh, e cappella um, concert at Historic Northampton, right in front of Shepherd's Barn. It's not a cappella, it was a Halloween e cappella. And there were, I don't know, 11, 12 different a cappella groups. And it was so fun to see for, see the Shepherd Barn using for using being used for what Historic Northampton has said it will be used for, which is public performances. And there were hundreds of people there, as I recall, it was a beautiful Saturday. So it's really exciting to to visit one of our one of our projects and see the Shepherd Barn in all its glory, entertaining uh, very scary a cappella performers. So so that was pretty cool. Uh, this Monday, there was the uh, Historic Preservation Plan. The consultant presented, and both Sarah and Chris. Uh, attended that Zoom meeting. And I don't know if either of you would like to comment on that, Chris, or Sarah, just summarize that for us. Just briefly, um, and Martha was also there uh, in a different capacity, um, but uh, a lot of good information. Um, I think it's going to be worth our time to have a discussion amongst ourselves at some point, since there are some provisions that deal specifically with the allocation of CPA funds uh, to historic preservation on municipal buildings versus the use of um, capital improvement funding for that, which uh, is a bridge we're going to cross this round and and probably uh, will continue to do so in the future. But some good information and a lot of hard work that went into uh, prepping the draft. Uh, Martha or Sarah, do you have any other things you'd like to add? Martha? Um, uh Sarah, do you want to, did you have something you wanted to say? I, I don't. Go ahead, Martha. Um, yeah, so this, I think that the consultants that have been working on this for 18 months um, have really put their time in, and they've done a fantastic inventory of the accomplishments the city has made um, over many years towards preservation, and also just outlining um, a lot of work that could and needs to be done um, you know, one of the biggest concerns about all of this is just that the city has limited capacity to implement recommendations because we have a very small commission. We're down two members um, and we're all volunteers and the planning office that does a fantastic job of staffing the commission um, is overwhelmed. So that's something that we're definitely going to have to work on, but um, it, we have a roadmap. And that's what that was what I was hoping for. And I think the other commission members were as well. Great. Sarah, any additional comments on that? Uh, I, I don't. That's a good summary. Great. OK, so that's my uh, my chair's report. We're going to move right on into the public comment uh, section here. Before we do that, let me just make a couple of notes. Um, first, again, is thank you all, all of you for joining us and making your um, uh, comments. Uh, it's very helpful for us to hear from folks out there. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we've had a chance to read proposals that have come to us to uh, provide written questions to applicants, to hear the applicants make presentations. And now it's time to hear from you, uh, your feelings uh, um, about the applicants. There are 10 different groups that have come to us for funding this cycle, this fall of uh, this fall cycle. Um, those 10 groups uh, are requesting $2.5 million in funding. We have available to us for both the fall and the spring $2.2 million. So again, the requests are for two and a half million we have 2.2 million available to us. We do have an option to bond. That means to essentially borrow or request the city borrow money to fund projects if in fact we wanna go over that. But just for you, for folks out there to know that uh, this will be some tough decision-making for us because again, there's that $300,000 differential, the two and a half million in requests, the 2.2 million available to us. Again, we have bonding as a possibility. 
We are the um, Community Preservation Committee. All of us are volunteers. We are not the ones that actually allocate the funds. That's city council. We are the recommending body. Uh, and we will go to city council, hopefully in December, with what our recommendations are. Uh, city council is very receptive to the amount of work that we put into this and for the most part goes ahead with our recommendations. Um, but anything anything is possible. So just for folks to know, we are the recommending body, um, city council, and you may wanna to talk to your city councilors as well. Uh, our uh, This is a chance again tonight to, to, to hear from all of you. On the agenda is begin funding recommendations if time allows. The chance of that happening are pretty slim. So for the most part, we're probably just gonna to listen to what you folks have to say tonight. And then our next meeting is when we will uh, begin and if it's possible end our recommendations. We try to get through that in one night. You're welcome to join us at that meeting. That's two weeks from tonight, November the 15th on a Wednesday night, also at seven o'clock. Um, you're welcome to join that meeting and any and all of our meetings. Again, the point of tonight is to listen to you. We will not respond. Uh, our job is not to, uh, to interact or have a dialogue with you. There are just too many of you out there. So our job is to listen to you. The thing I will probably say most tonight is uh, you're still on mute. You're still on mute. Get off mute. Um, so just remember before you speak to hit that little unmute button and then when you want to speak again to hit the mute button. Um, it can be nerve wracking for some of you to speak in public, even though it's Zoom public, uh, a public speak, it's still, it's still public speaking, rest assured. Uh, it's, uh, we are respectful and eager to hear what all of you have to say. So try to relax if that is, um, if that is stressful for you. There are a lot of you out there. So again, know that we, heard from applicants, we read the applications, we've written questions, we've had uh, site visits to a couple of the places. Um, so it's important to know that, that, that we do have a, a bunch of information already. Uh, for to, to queue in line, if you're new to this, if you can do what Barbara Blumenthal has done, which is to go down to the bottom of your screen there and there's a little button that says, uh, raise hands, I think. Um, hands are going up already. So most of you, uh, or a lot of you are familiar with this. Um, and again, I'll, I'll do my best simply to call on you in order. Some of you may want to respond to uh, multiple um, applicants. There are a number of recreational ones that are out there. Um, there's a couple planning and sustainability ones, a couple of housing ones. So feel free to uh, View, to voice your uh, position on more than one if that's if 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 you feel so inclined. Uh, so without further ado, I think that's it. Committee members, is there anything I forgot in terms of going over the ground rules for folks? Uh, to, um, we're good good to go. Okay. So uh, again, without further ado, we will begin and we'll start with. Oh, sorry, one more thing. If you will say your name and your address before you begin, that's helpful for us as well. We certainly entertain comments, not just from Northampton residents, but from everybody because a lot of our, the projects that we fund have uh, interest and our, uh, and applications to folks who live outside of Northampton as well. So we are certainly happy to hear from all of you. If you'll just say your name, and your address, that is helpful. We'll begin with Barbara Blumenthal, Barbara. Hi, thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Barbara Blumenthal, 39 Chapel Street in Northampton. And I want to very enthusiastically support the current application from historic Northampton. It um, occurs to me that historic Northampton has been a part of my life since the 1970s when I came to go to Smith College. And I volunteered there and a woman named Nancy Rexford was the um, costume uh, curator. And we did a lot of the um, work that 
helped to start uh, preserve the uh, better preserve the costume collection there. The uh, in the application you've read about the need for padded hangers and other things, and we were making padded hangers. But as the report said, literally decades ago, forty years ago or fifty years ago, we were doing that, and with new techniques um, and um, uh, new materials available, it's really important, and it's 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 really overdue to reassess this collection and really help to get it in in better shape. Uh, for the future and for study. It's it's a magnificent costume collection. I, I'm assuming that the CPC, um, they usually do site visits, so I don't know how much of the collection you were able to see, but it's really quite remarkable. And um, I also want to just thank the CPC for all the support you've given to Historic Northampton. Um, seven years ago, I think it is, when um, Laurie and Betty came to be co-directors there, they um, sort of spearheaded the, they spearheaded our coming back from the brink of extinction is how I like to think of it. The organization really needed a lot of help. And um, there's a lot of grants they've done, a lot of private and institutional donations, but the CP, the people of Northampton through the CPC have been a really important um, source of uh, funding to get us over the top so that we can do all this. And as you also said about the use of the barn now, um, it's really become much more of a community resource. We see people eating lunch, using our grounds as a picnic area. Um, and it would be really wonderful to be able to open the Parsons house up again and to do something with the Shepherd house. And so, as you know, the application is for those three projects, the, co the costume collection, and the other two houses, which which now need some help, we can. There's a long list of things to do, and I think Betty and Laurie are just marvelous in going by it one by one, figuring out with a great group of people and volunteers how to get things done. And as I said, the CPC is a really important part of that. So I hope you'll consider funding this uh, yet another um, request for funds. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Elizabeth Stern. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for giving us this opportunity to speak. I'm speaking also on behalf of Historic Northampton. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees. I've been involved for more than 10 years with Historic Northampton. I love Historic Northampton. Barbara's already spoken um, eloquently about our needs. Uh, I just wanted to focus a bit on the historic costume collection, because I've been going up every Wednesday afternoon and working with the interns and with the wonderful um, fashion and textile historian, Lynn Bassett, who's um, working with the collection now. Um, uh, we are um, archiving, assessing, describing, and repairing garments making sure they're stored safely. Uh, if you've ever, you probably haven't been up to the third floor, but if you have, you would see, or the second floor of the Damon building, the clothing is packed in there. There's not enough space. And I'm unfortunately, um, I get to fortunately get to see these beautiful garments, which are um, some of them very, um, uh, rare for um, um, in the world of, of preservation of textiles and clothing. Um, um, organizations from across um, New England in the Northeast borrow our garments for their exhibits, their museums. And um, uh, the Historic Northampton is known for its collection, which focuses on the um, 19th century, but spans three centuries from the mid 1700s through the mid 1900s. Um, but the unfortunate thing is I get to see the dust, um, the um, holes, the rips, the tears, and these gorgeous pieces of, of clothing because um, they can't be preserved perfectly 
until we get some help. Um, today, actually, there was a beautiful garment with fringe all around it, and there was a whole section about four inches long of fringe that had been eaten by mice. So mice damage, you know, some mundane things like that. Anyway, um, we very much appreciate your support in the past and look forward to um, being able to continue with our costume collection restoration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, uh, S uh, Simison, is it C. Simison? Cynthia. Cynthia. Good evening. My name is Cynthia Semison. I live at 190 Round Hill Road. Um, I happen to be the third generation of my family to live in this house. Um, so my uh, connection with historic Northampton, and I'm speaking on their behalf this evening, dates back to, to being a child and uh, first lessons in history and history of where I came from were in the Parsons house when children were welcomed in to tour and, uh, every spring, I think it was. And and uh, we were friends with Edith Shepherd next door in the Shepherd House. So my family's connection with historic Northampton dates back many years. I'll be frank about, you know, in the early 2000s, I about given up on historic Northampton. Um, and over the last seven years, um, under the stewardship of, of Lori and, and Betty, uh, they are doing an awesome job preserving our history, opening the buildings and all the artifacts to, to public engagement, to educating a new generation about our history and where we come from. Um, some of my grandmother's clothing is in that clothing collection. Um, my grandfather, maternal grandfather was a tailor and furrier on Main Street uh, for several decades during the mid 20th century. Um, so I can think of no better way to see um, these funds spent. And I think you all know now by the Shepherd Barn Project, how uh, good stewards of, of your funding and our history, uh, historic Northampton is. So I would encourage you to support this project and, and future efforts that are being undertaken. Thank you for allowing me this time to speak. Thank you. Susan? Hi, my name is Susan Sprung, and I live at 84 Pine Street in Florence. And I'm here to talk a little bit about the Pickleball Court um, project. Um, I am one of approximately 400 people who are actively playing pickleball in the Northampton area. Um, as many of you know, it is one of the, it is the fastest growing sport in the United States. Um, there are courts popping up all over the country, um, indoor and outdoor courts. And um, it is really, you know, I've lived in Northampton for 40 years. I've been involved in a lot of activities and projects and groups. And I honestly feel as though the pickleball project is one that really will cement um, a community of people um, that is active, that is social, that is healthy. And um, I feel that these funds would be used um, to really cement uh, pickleball in Northampton. Many other towns around Northampton have already um, built courts and many of us travel to other towns and we'd really like to stay in Northampton and, and play and be social and um, have a healthy outlet for our activities. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk tonight. Thank you, Susan. Lynn? Uh, Lynn Lepore? Lynn, are you out there? All right. We'll move on to oh. Deborah. Oh, hello. This is uh, Sue Tracy. Uh, Lynn Lepore is here. At um, She's gonna, just about to get on the... Um, we're at Bay Road uh, playing pickleball right now, and she's just about to get on. Great, thank you. 
Uh, let's see, if, if she's still waiting, Sue, do you wanna speak first and then we'll go to Lynn? Uh, certainly, yes, thank you. Um, I can turn my camera on here too, oops. Okay, um, so my name is Sue Tracy. I'm the program director of All Out Adventures in Northampton. And we run about 180 um, accessible adaptive programs per year right here in the Valley. And um, we have very much enthusiastically support um, funding um, pickleball courts at Sheldon Field um, because we just did um, a fundraiser and uh, raised money for three very fancy tennis chairs. And we've started an adaptive pickleball program at Look Park. And um, <clears throat> the transformations that are happening in people with disabilities and their family and friends are, is amazing. Um, it's uh, the game of pickleball. It really literally um, levels the playing field because, um, you know, from a socioeconomic perspective, it doesn't take any money at all to get into the game. Um, so I think it would do dovetail really nicely with um, what Northampton is trying to do with affordable housing, um, equity, inclusion, and so forth. Um, so this game can be adapted to any level of ability, physical ability, cognitive ability, age-related things like balance or somebody's had a stroke. Um, and, and as Susan mentioned, it's an amazing way to come together and um, get to know each other in the community, uh, different socioeconomic um, um, levels. And um, for example, like me personally, I have met a lot of um, retired professionals that I just never would have met in my life. And as a result, um, we did fundraising and raised over $10,000 to buy um, adaptive wheelchairs. And I just never would have access to um, people that could donate at that level. Um, and I'm also seeing that um, like that the youth in the community, um, it's somewhere to go. There's no cost to it. Um, they could come to open play and get mentored um, by um, older generation, retired people and so forth. And um, so it's just like a really wonderful thing that we really um, want to support and get behind. And just to let you know, we would support it 100% by providing wheelchair wheelchairs for people and also basic instruction. And also, um, we're just blown away by the 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 people that have that um, volunteer with us at the programs teaching progressions and basics and playing games and teaching the rules. Um, so anyway, it's just like an amazing thing. Um, on so many levels, um, mental health, uh, physical activity, inclusion, equity. And um, so thank you so much for considering. Thank you, Sue. Lynn, are you there now? Not quite yet. Okay, Deborah. Hi, I'm Deborah J. Anthony. I live at 141 Round Hill Road. Um, in Northampton. And I am, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Academy Music Theater Project. I strongly support this project. Um, when I, I, in 2008, when I started at the um, Academy of Music as the, as the executive director, I witnessed what can happen to an historic building when there's, um, extensive deferred maintenance. Um, since 2008, the um, city, CPA, and the Academy and its community have invested in renovations and upgrades that have allowed the Academy to grow programmatically and offer about 148 performances each year with over 60,000 patrons attending with 27,000, excuse me, with 27% traveling 75 miles or further, which <clears throat> supports the local businesses and um, restaurants. Um, <clears throat> when I first started here in 2008 and there had, hadn't been the care to the building, 
the I would come into work and the doors were wide open. They would just the wind would just blow them open. We had damage to the wooden joists from water coming in through the, through the building, and we had um, leaks in the roof uh, going through electrics on stage. There, there had been maintenance, some maintenance about a few years before I entered, uh, but it's been some time that there's been exterior work to the Academy of Music. And just recently, uh, we are starting to experience some leaks in the roof um, that have come through, through the roof, through the attic, the stairs, and um, into the salon, which was just recently renovated. An historic building like the Academy of Music is it, it's a cornerstone to cornerstone to this community, with many um, residents participating in our programs, whether they're on stage or their children are taking acting classes or musical theater um, product or involved in musical theater productions or buying a ticket and coming to a show and meeting up with neighbors and and gathering and experiencing art. It's important to to maintain this building to keep it safe. Um, I I also want to note that um, in this in this project uh, there'll be some repairs to the the masonry and rails, which I know there's cracks in the steps leading up to the academy, and the rails are not um, secured in there. And I'm worried about the safety for our our patrons. I, I strongly support this project and what it can accomplish and keeping it a, a safe and desirable um, venue to attend. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Lepore, we'll wait until you unmute yourself and then we'll know you're, you're there. Uh, Jennifer? Uh, thanks very much. I'm Jennifer Bryan. I live at uh, 608 Fairway Village in Leeds. And uh, would like to just speak briefly on behalf of the Pickleball Initiative. Um, <clears throat> you're going to hear from lots of folks tonight about uh, all the benefits of playing pickleball, right? Mm -hmm. About how it's going to keep us fit and uh, trim and uh, more healthy. I think the biggest um, bonus of pickleball is the way it brings uh, people together and creates community. I've met more people in the two years that I've been playing who live in my town, who live in neighboring towns. Um, I can't imagine another activity that would have created those opportunities. And they create them in very organic ways and then very, uh, you know, scheduled ways, which is wonderful. You can Go go to the courts and uh, look park and uh, plan on meeting three people there and you know next thing you know there are fifteen people there and your play group has expanded. Um, so in in this time of ours where bringing people together who cut across all kinds of differences and communities that's no small thing. I can say that in my my family. Uh, we span the entire political spectrum. We don't agree about the climate. We don't agree about politics. We don't agree about religion. We don't even agree about whether you should have a turkey at Thanksgiving. But we all agree that pickleball is a great game and it's a great way uh, to spend time together. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Andrew? Yes, thank you. I'm Andrew Crystal. I live at 51 Olander Drive, and I'm the president of the Academy Board. I'm here to speak in favor of funding the city's project. I'll, I'll give a little bit more context to what comments Deborah shared. I first got involved uh, after the city received about a $2 million Commonwealth grant for many of the same things that are being done now for really the, the uh, exterior shell of the building needed total repointing. We added the handicap ramps on the front and the new sidewalks <clears throat> and uh, ended up joining the board two years later. Um, we, at that point, the Academy was deeply in debt, had not done, as Deborah mentioned, deferred maintenance, hadn't done anything inside for many, many years. Um, Dwayne Robinson ran it basically as a cash business. 
we worked our way out of debt slowly. Luckily, hired Deborah in 2008, and along the way, as she referenced, uh, made many investments with um, the first capital campaign we ever had, with money from the CPC, with Mass Cultural Council funding, and with City of Northampton direct funding. Um, we did improvements to the auditorium, uh, all of the improvements on the stage, the Academy of Music paid for. We don't own the building. The Academy Board simply operates a city-owned building. So as we worked the business out of debt, we were able to add programming. We were able to start presenting our own shows, which the theater hadn't done for 60 years. And under Deborah's guidance, we started producing original work. So all of the money we made went back into capital improvements inside the theater, primarily on the stage and a new sound system, new lighting system, and into expanding our programming. So we simply as a board have not had the money to do the required continued maintenance on the exterior of the building. Um, as, as Deborah mentioned, we're starting to see leaks as the plans reference, there are places that need to be pointed now. So this is really the, the uh, optimal time to do the work that's being proposed to the exterior to preserve it so we can continue to grow the theater and improve the interior. And I appreciate your consideration of the grant. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Cindy? Cindy, you are you need to unmute yourself. Hi. There you go. Okay. Hi. I'm Cindy Chandler Guy. I live at 11 Crescent Street in Northampton. I've lived here about 50 years. And I just want to endorse my enthusiastic support for the Pickleball Project. Um, as a couple of people have already said, it is the fastest growing ex sport in the country. And, and I'm going to echo a lot of things that other people said. It, it is such a, a binding um, way to make community intergenerationally and socio socioeconomically that we're playing with people who are in their teens, latency age kids, all the way up to their 80s. And it's a way for new residents to, to build community and for those of us who have been here a while to, to welcome people into our community and to build better relationships within our community across all sorts of, of lines and spaces. We're the only community in the Valley and beyond that does not have courts. So lots of us have to travel to other towns to play safely because the courts that are available to us now in town at Look Park are not really safe. And there have been a lot of injuries. And we've never had public tennis courts at our disposal. And it would be really nice in this time when the sport is just exploding to have courts in the community for kids to grow up learning how to play and to be trained and mentored by older adults and for us who are aging and have aged out of some of the sports we used to be able to do, to be able to continue to have sports that we can do and enjoy doing with one another. Um, the, I wanna, what else can I say? There's also, there was one event this year in Holyoke that raised over $20,000 a year for an, an incredibly fabulous program run by Jane Lyons called Friends of Children that was run by pickleball, that was a pickleball event. And I can well imagine those of us who are dedicated to pickleball because we've been dedicated to making this happen would, would be forerunners in being able to use ourselves and the courts to raise money and, and support fundraising charitable efforts for other deserving um, nonprofits and, and projects. Um, so I just want to thank you for having the opportunity to talk and hope you'll consider the, you know, the span of ages that can access and utilize and benefit from having courts in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Steve? Good evening. Um, I, my name is Steve Guy. I live at 11 Crescent Street with a young woman who just spoke with you a moment ago. Um, 
I've been living here about 30 years. At one time, I used to play tennis over at Smith Folk. They had redone all the courts behind the recreation building, and then they deteriorated. And it was like, oh, my God, these things just fell apart. So I backed over to, to Look Park and played tennis there for a while. And those courts were pretty decent. And then I discovered something called pickleball, which I've been playing now for about two and a half, three years. And as other people have mentioned, it is a wonderful sport that brings all kinds of ages and groups and ideologies and belief systems together. Uh, one of the things about the sport, besides the activity, besides the exercise, is the camaraderie, the friendships. Uh, people there tend to enjoy themselves, not just with the exercise, but with the friendships. And one of the things that I like most about the area is that it's mostly people from Northampton. I don't need to have people coming from all over the, the, the valley. There are enough people in Northampton that could really benefit by doing this. One of the other things is that exercise is helping me to move further and further away from possibly dementia. I'm getting it. I'm an older person in the town. And I know that exercise is essential to helping us have a clear mind and healthy bodies. So I'd like to thank all of you for letting us all have a chance to speak about the importance of having pickleball in Northampton. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Jane? Hi, Brian. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, and thank you to the CPC for allowing us to speak tonight. Um, I'm here with my partner, Joan Tabachnik, and we're going to give you two, speak two speakers for a short period of time. Um, we are neighbors and supporters of 23 Laurel Street, and we rise tonight to speak in favor of that part of the agenda. The 20 units of affordable housing for families and survivors of intimate partner violence are very important to us. Um, Joan's going to speak a little bit about our uh, concerns about um, intimate partner violence and safe passage. And I'm going to just say a word about affordable housing. Yeah, you know, just to say that that um, long-term supporter of safe passage, I've also worked for 30 years in the field of sexual violence prevention, and we do not have a lot of housing available for um, for, for domestic violence survivors and um, having a, a not only affordable housing, but affordable housing that also has this target uh, population would be incredibly useful um, in terms of diversity of our of our community. And uh, it's really needed. So I just wanted to say that I wanted to put our support in as, um, and it'd be really amazing to have them as our neighbors since we live at 16 Monroe Street. Yeah. And okay. in terms of um, our support for the proposal, we're really also long-term supporters of Valley CDC. We think they're doing an amazing job and we couldn't think of better stewards for this kind of project here in our neighborhood and for our city. That's it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jane and John. Uh, Deanna? Or Dina, sorry. Hi, this is Deanna Simons. Um, my name is Deanna Parsons Simons, and I live at 17 Beacon Street in Binghamton, New York, which is in upstate. Um, I am here to enthusiastically support Lori and Betty at the Historic Northampton and their efforts to gather firm support to complete an updated and thorough study of the Parsons House uh, on, on the ground circa 1719. Uh, which is the first step for restoring and reopening the house to the public. Um, I am the president of the Parsons Family Association, and I know there are others on the call tonight. Um, I am one of the shy ones, um, but I did raise my hand. Um, and we are also a volunteer effort that is dedicated to preserving the Parsons descendants uh, that were begun in Northampton, Massachusetts, and specifically the Nathaniel Parsons home. Um, we are all descendants of Cornet Joseph Parsons, one of the original founders of Northampton, and the home is literally a cornerstone of our association. Um, the Parsons Family Association celebrated our 100th year reunion 
and spent several days this summer in Northampton um, and were guests of Lori and Betty. And um, it was a, a truly a glorious event. And we brought in many people from, um, from the area to celebrate with us. I am on this call tonight because I feel very strongly that the Parsons House uh, needs that support to continue literally and figuratively um, to help Northampton, Massachusetts continue to be really uh, a, the glorious spot that it is. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Gina? Hello, thank you. I'm Gina Norton Smith. I live in Northampton. I'm also the uh, treasurer for the uh, Board of Trustees for Historic Northampton. And so I'm coming to speak with you tonight in support of the request of Historic Northampton. I won't talk about the clothing collection, which is really important and amazing. Uh, if you haven't seen it, really, you should um, try and get to see it. Some beautiful, beautiful things. Um, I want to address my comments on the request to support the study of the two buildings. Um, this would begin the process of restoring those two buildings with a historic property. You can't just call a contractor and start work. You really have to understand what you have, um, what the building needs, and um, what the building needs. And you can tell from the way that the barn has been restored with all of the items that are in there uh, that are in the collection, but really um, the restoration was done in a way that really uh, people can feel the history. And the way the building was restored, I'm talking about the way the community was engaged in the process of restoring the building, the moving of the barn out of the way so the new foundation could be poured, the moving of the building back, um, the way people were engaged, people were invited to come in and help with the, the process of building, actually hands-on, um, you know, and then the, the pegs that people could uh, buy to put their little bit of, of identity in this new life for the barn. Um, so I think it's not supporting this kind of activity isn't just about preserving the buildings. It's about engaging with the community um, and getting the community to engage with the history that is at historic Northampton. So we can understand what that history means for who we are today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. Cheryl? Yeah, hi, my name is Cheryl Musio. I live at 58 Fort Street here in Northampton, and I've lived here for about 45 years. And I'm uh, speaking tonight in favor of the uh, funds being, some funds being expended for pickleball. Um, as everyone said, it's a, it's the growth of pickleball in our area in particular. I've been playing for probably, I don't know, four years maybe. Um, and and the growth in that time has, has been remarkable. Uh, the community has grown from uh, a handful of people to the over 400 that we have now. Um, and uh, it is accessible to a large age range and as someone who uh, is an old softball player and soccer player, uh, I've I've uh, found that being able to play pickleball has really allowed me to to remain athletic and to remain active and to be connected with a wonderful group of people. Also, as a psychologist in the community, which I am, um, I. Uh, I have uh, encouraged clients to play pickleball. It's it's good for one's mental health, and uh, the the clients that have uh, gone out there and given it a try 
have really benefited from it in any number of ways, um, as I myself have. So, uh, so thank you for the opportunity to support this important project. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, George? Hello, everyone. George Kohout, 234 State Street here in Northampton. Um, I'm here tonight as the president of the Friends of the Northampton Rail Trails, Friends of uh, the Bike Pass, our 11-mile network here in the city. Um, I'm here to support the applications of the Office of Planning and Sustainability for two pretty exciting projects that have been in the works, one a little bit longer than the other. One is the uh, Rocky Hill Greenway connector between Route 66 and Ice Pond down to Route 10, where the pedestrian bridge crosses over to East Hampton. Um, it's, we're getting very close to getting uh, shovels in the ground on this one. And the city just needs that little extra support to work with the engineering on this. Um, it'll get people off the roads, Route 66, which is very, a tricky road if you've ridden on it or riding a bicycle on it. And it also gives us more access to East Hampton <clears throat> because our bike path, our trail network is really a regional network more and more used for commuting back and forth between towns. And it's extremely important in terms of our city reaching the climate goals. We need to keep our eye kind of on that focus of uh, where is the city? How do we get people out of their cars for trips that can be done either by walking or bicycles? This little trail, though it's not big, can really um, be a big link in our network. The other um, application is for a very exciting expansion of the trail from the Damon Road area along the railroad tracks in the Connecticut River to Hatfield. Um, again, it's expanding kind of the regional network for bicyclists, which is wonderful. And it won't just be used by bicyclists. I appreciate all of the avid pickleball fans here, speaking of community. Um, community happens also on the rail trails and the bike paths. Um, there's a great diversity. It breaks down barriers that we know exist in our community. So those two projects, um, please keep them in mind as you go through your, your vetting of uh, the, the many that you have in front of you tonight. And I'll take off my friend's hat for a minute and just talk for a moment to support the Office of Planning Sustainability's project on the Boggy Meadow Road into the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. Although it's just a third of a mile, it's a, a beginning of uh, uh, making that route more accessible for people who have mobility issues. It doesn't get them all the way to the, to the lake. It doesn't get them deep into the forest, but it provides us with some new handicapped parking, which then allows people to get out of their cars, onto their devices, whatever they may be, and along the path at the Fitzgerald Lake. So that, that too is worth your consideration. Um, and I could go on and on. There's a lot of great projects here today but I hope you can uh, prioritize the bike path ones. Thanks for your time and uh, adios. Thank you, George. Uh, John? Hello, good evening, everybody. My name is John Sturdivant. I'm a recent arrival from the West Coast. I transplanted here with my wife and my two kids. And I was, I'm advocating for a pickleball. Um, being new here in town, not knowing anybody, I was immediately welcomed warmly into the pickleball community. And um, yeah, it's a good thing. People are talking about, about the diversity inclusive and, and inclusiveness, which I kind of this area is sort of famous for, even on the West Coast. Uh, when we told people where we we're moving um, to a person, they said, it's a great place very warm, welcoming, diverse, and I found that all to be true. And um, and that's a pickleball core is exemplary of that, uh, of, that of those statements of uh, inclusivity and welcome, um, feel very welcome. And uh, yeah, so I'm just advocating for that. And didn't know about the bike path thing. Um, I've been riding my bike all over and uh, I actually ride my bike to pickleball. And uh, anyhow, it's, uh, Appreciate your time and consideration. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have to say. I advocate for pickleball and bike path. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. Uh, Mitch? Yeah, thank you again. Um, I'll speak on behalf of uh, the Pickleball. My name is Mitch Dara. I live at 117 Olander Drive up in Village Hill and play very often. And I know many in the city and around here that could not attend tonight. And I'll uh, echo their thoughts as well as most of what those who have spoken said. Um, it's popular, it's growing. It's a very accessible sport. Um, it's not, as we said, physical and mental. There's a social aspect, a health aspect. Um, it's, it's, it's an investment on so many fronts uh, that would be made. And most towns around here have pickleball courts, many of them new. Um, but I have to go 20 minutes in one direction or another, and two of those would require me to become members or, or pay fees. So I will echo and add my voice to uh, funding for the pickleball courts. Thank you. Thank you, Mish. Uh, TC? Hi, um, my name is Thea Calkins and I live at 32 Bright Street in Northampton. Um, and I'm also here to uh, speak to the allocation of funds for pickleball. Um, first of all, to all my pickleball pals, I had my hip replacement in Boston yesterday and it went well. And I came home last night. And um, I think the reason I mention that is that um, the pickleball community has been incredibly supportive. I've been playing for now a year and a half and I have made the most amazing friends. Um, I've gotten texts and calls of support. I've got casseroles and soup coming to my house. All these wonderful people um, are supporting me and it, it, it wouldn't have happened but for pickleball. Um, so I can speak to the community that it has um, created and I'm very thankful for that. And, and I would hope that the town would support that. Um, so that's why that's relevant. Now I have my new hip, so I look forward to beating everybody on the pickleball court. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I am relatively new. I've participated in a lot of things in town since I moved here. Um, I've taken advantage of classes at the Hill, music things, tennis, volunteering, but I can say by far and away, pickleball has um, been the strongest community among all of those activities. And I just, I can't say enough about it. And I am living proof as of yesterday and today with all the support that I've received. Um, the other thing that I think is relevant is that I'm a retired cardiologist. Um, and quite honestly, you know, two of the major determinants of, of health are um, exercise and social connections. And I think pickleball, you know, provides both of those and people have spoken to that. I think without having dedicated courts here that are, you know, part of the community, um, it, it, do, it, would, it would address, if we had that, it would address the issues of safety. I, I really do believe that the pickleball courts at Look Park are really not safe to be playing on. Um, they're really falling into disrepair. And there is a, a, a financial consideration. It is, it could be a bit um, exclusive to some people. So my feeling is if you were to build um, the recreational pickleball courts, um, you would decrease a lot of barriers, provide a safe environment um, and support a community that is all, already strong and th thriving. Um, I would say if you build it, they will come, but they're already here. So help them out kind of thing. Um, and that's all I have to say. We wish you a speedy hip recovery. Thank you so much. <laughs> quick return to pickleball. Uh, thank Lily? You. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. I'm Lily Dwight and I am the elector under the will of Oliver Smith for Deerfield. I also serve on the Community Preservation Committee of Deerfield as well. And I want to just say, I do not envy thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm speaking in support of the Smith Charities application for the funds to pay for the building assessment. The building assessment will give us an update in identifying the critical work to be prioritized. The Smith Charities building is the physical manifestation of the long-term commitment of Smith Charities to the future of Northampton and Smith Vokes specifically too. 
As well as housing the charitable organization, the building is an historic gem in the heart of the town. And preserving the building creates the potential for more extensive use of its facilities, which myself and a number of the electors are hoping to see happen. So um, in short, that's it. I hope you will consider our application. I wanna thank you for all the support that you have shown to Smith Charities in the past and hopefully the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, Lisa? Uh, there you are. Yes, hi, thank you. Boy, I don't envy your job. It's been really interesting um, hearing about all the different projects here tonight. I came here um, specifically to advocate for the Pickleball Project. Um, as people have already mentioned, pickleball is really beneficial for physical, mental, emotional health, um, as well as an incredibly welcoming and inclusive community. So I'm here primarily to um, not take up any more time by repeating what everybody else has already said about hoping that y'all support the pickleball projects. But I will throw in, it's been very interesting hearing about other projects tonight. So. I don't envy your job, but still, uh, one more vote for pickleball. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, woman by the name of iPhone. <laughs> uh, you are still muted. I don't know, yeah. do you mean phone five? Yes. That's you. Oh, okay. I, I'm an iPad, um, and I cannot figure out how to rename it. I can usually rename it, and I can't. My name is Suzanne Metz. I live at 20 Bridge Road, Unit 32 in <laughs> Lawrence, and we moved here, my husband and I, three years ago, and during COVID, um, somebody said, if you want to go meet people, go down to Look Park and join a pickleball group, and you'll meet people. And my husband and I both took up pickleball and it really, as everybody says, it, it's given us community, it's given us friendships, it's given us our health. Um, and while I'm finding it instructive listening to people articulating their interests in town, and I see that it's difficult to allocate funds to all these when we go from town to town, we visit family, we visit friends in Massachusetts and other states, many towns are committing to building these courts for their residents. And they'll say, oh, come look at uh, redone tennis courts, or come look at they turn this field into pickleball courts. It really welcomes people into the town. If people are choosing to change communities, they are now considering what pickleball opportunities. My husband and I play, I have a daughter who's very active in tennis and soccer, and she's now taking up pickleball with her group of friends, which I find interesting because they can be playing all kinds of other sports and they're finding this. We take our grandchildren out and we play pickleball with them. So it is intergenerational as well. And I, I Many people have spoken. So I just wanted to say that it really has made a difference and it will make a difference positively in this community as well if you invest in, in these courts. Thank you. Not only will pickleball solve all of the world's problems and bring us all together, but we'll create names on uh, Zoom calls. Your name has magically appeared, Suzanne, when it was an iPhone 5 before, so uh, isn't that something? Uh, let's see, uh, Henry, I'm sorry, Tom, Tom Larkin. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Larkin. My husband's Tom, we're both here listening. Um, both 70 year residents of Northampton, born, bred and raised here and taught here and contributed as coaches and recreation commissioners over the course of our 70 years here. Um, we again are calling to um, support the uh, development of pickleball in the community, which begins clearly with the uh, 
building of pickleball courts. It's hard to do a program without the facility. Um, I taught at Northampton High School for 30 years, and we introduced pickleball, myself and a lot of my colleagues, in the 80s when it was uh, in its birth to the students at Northampton High School. Uh, and unfortunately, we could not continue because we didn't have court space um, outdoors, and we had limited gymnasium uh, space. So the programs, um, not because of popularity, but because of uh, facilities uh, eventually um, diminished. And unfortunately, uh, we still haven't acquired court space in Northampton. We've lost court space when Smith Vocational uh, land and property was sold. And that was a school court that uh, is no longer in existence. Um, so I fully support uh, replacing that court space um, as a designated pickleball space, and again, can speak to the attributes of, of pickleball, both the physical, mental, and social health um, benefits. But primarily, it's a huge community builder. It uh, has community support, clearly, so it, can, it uh, aligns with the CPA criteria in that regard. Uh, there are a significant number of residents that are um, hoping that you will consider um, the recreational value of these courts. Um, and my experience and my husband's experience with um, other courts and other programs have led us to a lot of volunteer opportunities to help run the programs in other towns. So it's uh, to Northampton's advantage to enlist the help of all of this interest in pickleball um, for volunteer community support as well. Um, so I, again, can't reiterate enough what everyone else has said regarding um, the benefits of pickleball for the community. And I don't envy your position and trying to divvy up the funds because there are a lot of good causes. Um, but I hope you will consider uh, Northampton's long awaited need for court space specifically for pickleball as it is uh, a growing sport with more than 3 million people playing uh, in the United States. Um, so it definitely would serve this community. Thank you for considering um, the request. Thank you. Uh, Henry? Uh, Henry Fairley, are you there? Uh, yes. Hi. Am I unmuted? Uh, you are. Hi. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, I am also in support of the pickleball courts. Though that said, I certainly would support the rail trail and historic uh, Northampton projects as well. But uh, pickleball is something that I leave the town. I go to East Hampton and South Hadley, Southampton, Westfield. Uh, I mean, all this, somebody else said all these towns have courts. Not only do they have courts, but they're in their second uh, adding them. Westfield has six courts and they just got the okay to add six more. And, you know, they're they're bringing people in. When, when, you, when you leave and you go somewhere, you know, you do your shopping because that's where you happen to be. And it'd be nice if Northampton could attract people you know, have, have tournaments, bring people into uh, to our restaurants and shopping, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I choose not to use a, a private park that, that costs money and has uh, courts that are, are not very good repair. Um, and uh, hope, uh, hope, hope you look at it. So I think the Berkshire design did a great job on their um, layout if anyone wants to look at it on the city's uh, website. Um, if they had to um, cheat anywhere, I would say, you know, if you waited to a second year for the bathrooms and water fountains, that's great, but don't compromise on on the full amount of courts because you'll find at some point that even those won't be enough. Um, thanks for your time. Um, bye. Thank you, Henry. Uh, Lori. Oh, thank you so much. Um, this is Laurie Sanders. 
I'm the, one of the co-executive directors of Historic Northampton, and I live in West Hampton. And I'm, I, of course, I'm in favor of the application that uh, Historic Northampton's uh, submitted. But I also wanted to provide um, a supportive comments to the uh, preservation efforts for two of the city's most iconic buildings, uh, City Hall and the Academy of Music. And I thought in terms of some context, I would um, just read a quote from 1882, 140 years ago, regarding City Hall and the ideas then. This was submitted to the um, Hampshire County Journal by Benjamin Lyman, who was then the head of the Village Improvement so Society. And so this is what he said, it's a long article, but I'm just gonna cut right to the part that I think will entertain uh, the members of the CPC and the other people on this call still. Um, he goes on to say, as regards hideous public buildings like our town hall, perhaps our society would have a special opportunity to induce the setting out of vines like Virginia Creeper, then in a few years would mitigate the ugliness. I think we can all laugh and say we're happy that the application in front of the CPC is not for setting out vines, but for attending to the details that really make the building, uh, its preservation of significance, it enhances the beauty of the building. Um, you know, he wrote this in 1882, so the Academy of Music wasn't uh, constructed then because so I don't know how he felt about that but he does go on to also slam the courthouse more than one of the churches the railroad stations the schools and several college buildings so he had a real fascination with vines but in in regard to um, the proposals in front of you I, I, I think you know as a, a historic Northampton is very much in support of the efforts to um, attend to the details and um, address address the needs of both the Academy of Music and 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 uh, City Hall, which are two of the most important um, historic structures in downtown. And as George and other people said, there are many other applications here in front of you um, that uh, with wearing my other hat, I would uh, I would support. But um, in terms of the three for preservation that I wanted to speak on tonight, those those are the three. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Laura. Um, Alexis. Hi, everybody. Thank you for letting me have a few minutes to speak. I'm Alexis Breitnecker, and I'm the executive director of Valley Community Development. And we are the applicant for 23 Laurel Street. We're requesting gap funding for um, the difference between state funding and what we know construction costs are going to be to build 20 affordable units. And while we may not be pickleball, um, we are housing for folks who need housing. And one of the big priorities in Northampton and in our region at large is to increase the supply of affordable housing. And we are trying to do just that up on Hospital Hill. Um, so I just want to note that we have had a number of um, supporters who have written in their support, which I don't know if it's going to be read tonight, probably not, but I just want the larger community to know um, that it's not just a few of us speakers. There are people who were able to support and just couldn't make the Zoom meeting tonight. So um, I urge the CPC to support this request for um, $420,000 to do our gap funding, which will make it possible for 20 families to have affordable housing on Hospital Hill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, Myrna? Hi, um, I'm Myrna Breitbart. I live at 37 Monroe Street in Northampton. Um, I lived in Northampton in the late 70s and in the uh, 80s and then we moved to Amherst and we moved back to Northampton uh, about 12 or 13 years ago. And um, I want to speak to two projects actually. Um, I want to uh, speak in favor of the Valley CDC project on Laurel Street. Um, I, I've been involved um, in, I was involved in the uh, 80s um, with Bev Bates and others uh, in a, an organization called Housing and Economic resources for women. And uh, we helped to de develop the project on Earl Street, which was a single room occupancy project, as well as um, some projects in Holyoke and so forth. Um, I can't 
say enough about Valley CDC as an organization and having that proximity on Laurel Street to downtown for families as well as hopefully to the pickleball courts that might be nearby. Um, it will be, uh, I think, an invaluable addition uh, to the city. Uh, in the 80s, I did a report for the, the city on affordable how the need for affordable housing. It was a, a survey of residents and um, the need was enormous then. It's it's unfortunately grown even, even further. So I'm very much in support of that. And I am very, very much in support of the pickleball courts. Um, when I moved back to Northampton uh, 12 years ago, um, uh, I, uh, you know, I knew obviously had friends here, but um, I have tripled my friendships since uh, beginning to play pickleball. I, I, I know everybody said this before, but it's an extremely community, an amazing community building uh, uh, sport and experience. And I guess I don't wanna repeat what everybody else has said, but I do wanna say that um, if you're thinking that Look Park is sufficient in terms of pickleball courts, please, please reject that idea because it's not. Um, it, look, look Park was a, a good start to our community building, but the courts themselves are are not in good shape. I personally uh, uh, was there when uh, people got injured on those courts, and uh, in addition, there it's there are two charges that uh, charges that are made if you want to use those courts. One is getting into Look Park. There is a charge. And then there is a charge for the use of those courts. And, and therefore, it really isn't uh, affordable or accessible to a large number of people in the community. And, uh, and, and it needs to be. I also think that um, the, the pickleball really is being taught in the schools now, in some phys ed classes and so forth. And so the, the number of young people who are gonna come in and want to use courts is growing enormously. And I, you know, I think the best part of the sport is how intergenerational it is and how there really isn't a ladder that you know, somehow separates old people from young people and taking up this sport. And, um, and it's been wonderful to make those young friendships as well as, as the older ones. Um, so I support both of these these projects, and uh, I really do appreciate the work that Berkshire Design has done uh, on uh, on the courts that they're proposing in Northampton. I think that it, I think it'll be a wonderful addition to the community. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Myrna. Uh, Mark. Hi. I will try not to take too much time. Um, my wife and I are supporters of the Pickleball Initiative and uh, particularly of AOA uh, and their work with folks who um, need opportunities to participate. So um, it is an amazing sport and amazing way of connecting people in the community and the existing courts in Northampton, especially, well, the only ones in Northampton that look park are simply not usable. So we look forward to the committee considering Northampton becoming one of the many communities in our neighborhoods who uh, support pickleball courts locally. Um, sorry, I didn't say I live at 6 Cyrano Road in Haydenville, um, and we are active participants in the um, activities of Northampton. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Now is your time, folks. Um, on the bottom of your screen should be that option. Oh, here we go. Uh, Carol? Yes, hi. I, I apologize. I was teaching and uh, just got done. Uh, so I wasn't there to speak on behalf of Smith Charities, but uh, uh, is this an okay time to make a comment, or did you mean sure, just no, on? We're still making comments. Oh, okay, wonderful. Thank it's you. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, I I understand. Um, 
uh, Lily Dwight spoke in favor. And I also just wanted to uh, mention, we had some letters of support from our prior applications. And, um, and so we would also ask that they be included. I can forward them again, but they should be in your folders from our prior applications. Uh, and yeah, we just, we have always really appreciated support from uh, from the Community Preservation Act grants. And we think that this grant, uh, the $25,000 will allow us to, uh, to get an updated plan that's in compliance with all the current uh, building requirements and will allow us to map out a historic preservation plan for hopefully the next five to 10 years. Uh, and uh, as I said, we're, we are also relying on other grants. Um, we're very thankful for the 50,000 we just got from the Mass Historic. Uh, uh, and also there's another uh, matching grant from um, Mass Historic Preservation that we will be filing a letter of eligibility for. Uh, that's due um, actually in about a week or so. Um, and uh, and we also you know welcome anybody to, uh, we're gonna do another uh, open house um, between uh, right after the holidays. So uh, we did a couple before. Uh, so if you'd like to come and see the building, tour the building, uh, we'd be happy to have, uh, to, we'll alert you about that. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, uh, thank you for your prior support, and we hope you'll look favorably on, on this application as well. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Gina? Thank you. I want to say that I am very much in support of the affordable housing proposal. Um, Northampton is desperately in need of affordable housing, and uh, we're talking about um, Increasing diversity in this city, that's one way to do it. The other thing I wanna speak in favor of is the um, the Greenway plans and the, uh, the at Rocky Hill and the other plan because everyone in the city, every type of person in the city uses those paths and um, it really helps people get around without regard to their economic station and it really does connect so many so many places in the city for people um, in a safe way. Uh, so I hope I hope that um, those two projects will get some serious consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Any other folks who have not spoken who would like to? Now is the time. Hands up. Sarah, are you seeing anybody? Uh, I am not, uh, but Lynn LaFord did send a message to me earlier saying that, that she was here to support the pickleball. But I, I think she couldn't unmute. Okay, another, another pickleballer. Uh, anyone else with your hands up? Okay, well, folks who spoke, uh, thank you so much. And folks who are just listening, thank you. We have such an articulate uh, community and it's so helpful and useful and wonderful for us as the Community Preservation Committee to hear what folks have to say. And people are so respectful in terms of time, uh, in terms of not uh, going on and on and on. So we as a committee certainly appreciate that as well. People are respectful of, of each other and also to us as a community. Uh, if I may reiterate, our next meeting is two weeks from tonight. That is November 15th. Um, I'm thinking that my fellow committee members will agree that we are not going to uh, begin funding deliberations um, tonight. Uh, that it's that we, we'd like to try to get that done in one meeting so our minds are fresh and uh, otherwise, we we just we couldn't do that. Getting a thumbs up from Julia, I'm assuming nodding heads that we're good to good to wait on that. Um, so again, we encourage you to to uh, come and listen to our deliberations on the 15th. We may go to the 29th as well. Again, a reminder: we are the recommending body. City Council is the one that does the funding, and you're certainly welcome to um, uh, continue to make written comments 
uh, on the city's website as well as to comment your city councilors as as well. Uh, I would encourage everyone to get out and vote a week from yesterday, right? So that's the sixth, I think. Uh, we have a number of um, important uh, seats that are up there for city council, for uh, school committee, for other other things as well. So just encourage uh, folks to get out and, and vote. Um, let's see. So looking at our uh, agenda, we're not going to do funding recommendations tonight, right? We're good good with good with moving on. I'm seeing nodding nodding up heads. Any other business that is not foreseen when the agenda was published? Uh, any members, anything else? Question from me. Uh, so yeah. is there anything that anyone needs to help them deliberate or to prepare for the meeting? I did just today receive uh, scenarios from bond council and I'll put those together for everybody to take a look at. Um, I'll also put together draft council orders. Is there anything else that anybody needs? Not hearing it. Um, Kevin and uh, Chris Tate, uh, new to our committee, going on to the CPC website, uh, all the written comments are posted there. So if you want to continue to look at what people have to say, um, there are a lot of them that are out there uh, for a, for quite a few of the projects. Uh, some of the folks spoke tonight, but others did not speak. So it might be worth your while to take a quick a quick look at that. And again, um, those comments I imagine will continue to come on until we begin our uh, our deliberations. Um, I think if people do have uh, additional I'm sorry. requests. Uh, Chris, was there? Sorry, Chris? I I um I lost my internet connection. I had to switch over to the phone, and I'm not very facile, um, so I didn't get a chance to unmute. Um, but I I actually maybe I'll follow up with you by email, Sarah. But you you discussed um bonding scenarios. What are we um What are we talking about there? Uh, so these would be you know, just in case the committee does want to consider bonding of um one of the projects. Bond, bond council put together some potential scenarios. There's different ways to bond. You can front load it with payments, um, just pay, you know, flat uh, interest and in, in payments over the, the course of a project. Uh, so I, I, I have some things for the committee to consider if, if that's something that you want to move forward with. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you about, and since we're talking about it is um, this hasn't happened in my experience, but, but um, and I don't need an answer now. But one of the things I'm interested in is um, because we're just a recommending body, um, it's conceivable that we might suggest bonding for uh, one or multiple programs and the city council and its wisdom find that that's not the way they want to go. Um, if that were the case, what I want to know is, do they kick it back to us so we have a chance to rejiggle our funding? in order to reallocate funds to cover more bases, or uh, if if we send it over to the council and they reject the, the bonding component, are we sort of stuck with our original recommendations? Uh, it's not something that's happened before, so I don't know exactly what the process would look like. Um, and typically, the way it's worked in the past, the committee has worked with bond council to put something together that, that makes financial sense and would able to be bonded. Um, like the, the ones, for example, that I suggested um, were City Hall, Academy of Music and Pickleball. Some of the projects, although they're, they're great projects, aren't allowable to be bonded pursuant to state law, separate from CPA. Yeah. Some of them That'd present be other challenges. So those those are the ones I threw out there, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what it would look like if city council decided that that's not something they wanted to move forward with. Okay. It sounds like you got the basis covered. I just, I was thinking this week that I wanted to touch base with you about that because I think it would be a shame for us to be really supportive of a program and find that because of whatever reasons, you know, fiscal reasons not related to our recommendations that the council was reluctant to take on bonding. And um, I just wanted to see where we, where we lay on that, but I think. Yeah. I mean, at, 
at the very least, I would anticipate that a recommendation for bonding would be kicked to the city council finance committee, and that yeah. would provide some opportunity for additional uh, discussion. And All right. Great. Thank you. So, Sarah, you'll send out a little email to us regarding bonding and what that's all about. Yeah. Yeah. Great. For those folks that are listening, CPC has recommended bonding uh, before, and uh, Pulaski Park is one of the projects. Florence Fields is another. The Bean Allard Farm is another. Uh, the, let's see, um, Forbes Library was another, right? So we've done bonding in the past and uh, uh, and has, and has, it is an option that, that we certainly have. Someone had their hand up. Was it Bev? Who was uh, it? No, that uh, was Kevin. me, Brian. Uh, uh, since this is my first time through and since we do not have adequate funds to fund everything, if we decide to partially fund uh, what's the dialogue with the applicant to decide, like uh, when Chris and I did a site visit, for instance, uh, there were some of the repairs to the Academy or City Council, uh, City Hall that uh, would be necessary to prevent uh, further intrusion of water. Um, there are other things that you wouldn't want to do until um, it had been, uh, and so the sequencing and the partial idea of uh, partial funding. I don't know how that works. This is my first time through. And um, I'm just wondering procedurally, is there a dialogic opportunity with applicants uh, about partial funding? Uh, Kevin, we can certainly continue this discussion two weeks from now. In the past, and we've done partial funding quite a bit. Uh, and other committee members can speak to this as well. Our attempt is not to micromanage. Um, we've often given partial funding and then allow the applicant to uh, um, differentiate how they or, or decide how they want to allocate the funds that are available to them based on their own priorities. Um, we've done that without really, you know, knowing that it's it's a difficult conversation and it's a difficult to to try to prioritize. But um, it's 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 something that 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 we can do and we'll have that discussion, I imagine two weeks from now. So thank you for bringing thank that you. up. Uh, anything else that committee members wanna bring up at this point? Okay, folks out there um, listening, thank you very much for sticking with us and for being supportive of the, of, of the process here. Once again, we'll we meet in two weeks from now on, De on December, on November the, what is it, 15 uh, at seven o'clock. Um, so without further ado, is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, Julia, a second, uh, Kevin. Sarah, thank you so much for all your work on our behalf and the city's behalf. And uh, we will see you in two weeks.